Welcome to an introduction to chemistry brought to you by Parkbench Tutors. For more information on Parkbench Tutors, simply look us up on Facebook or visit parkbenchtutors.com. In this short podcast, we're going to take a look at bonding and structure. There are a number of different types of bonds, and these are the common groups that you will find referred to. Ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and covalent bonds, maybe non-polar covalent bonds or polar covalent bonds. So what do all these terms mean? Let's start with ionic bonding. Normally atoms right, that have a full valence electron shell are considered relatively stable. Those you might remember are the inert gases. So bear in mind then that this is going to be concerned with the number of electrons in a valence shell. So atoms tend to gain, lose, or to share electrons, and the purpose of that is to achieve some sort of stable electron configuration. Noble gases then have the full valence shells and are stable, and pretty inert as well. And so you'll sometimes see this described as atoms are trying to obtain the configuration, the electron configuration of a noble gas. So let's consider oxygen and look at the Lewis dot diagram for oxygen. We can say there are, see there are six electrons there in the valence shell. So if it can find a way of gaining or sharing two more electrons, then it would have a stable electron configuration. The electron configuration would be that of neon, the noble gas, which has got eight electrons in that outer shell. So, okay, where's it going to get do this, or how is it going to do this? If it can gain two electrons, in other words, if it can take two electrons from somewhere, it will have a charge, and the charge will be of those two electrons. We would then write it as O with two minuses to show that we've got the two charges of negative electrons. In other words, it has two more electrons than it has protons. So it would then be called an oxide iron. And ions that have got a negative charge are called anions. And those, by the way, that have a positive charge are called cations. So a compound that's formed in this way by gaining or losing electrons is said to be an ionic compound. And the oxides of calcium and sodium are examples of ionic compounds. So that in calcium oxide, calcium has lost two electrons, so it's left with two positive charges, and oxygen has gained two electrons, so it's left with two negative charges. So we can write it as Ca2 plus plus O2 minus is CaO. We can do the same for sodium and oxygen. In this case, two sodium ions are needed, each one of which will lose an electron, so that the oxygen atom can gain its two electrons. Okay, so when atoms share electrons with other atoms, then we have something different, right? Ionic bonding was concerned with gaining and losing, but you can also have sharing of electrons, and then we get what we call covalent bonds. So nitrogen plus oxygen giving nitric oxide is an example of sharing electrons. We write it's N2 plus O2 is 2NO. Hydrogen and oxygen forming water is another example of sharing electrons. So how do we know whether we're dealing with an ionic or covalent compound? What are the clues here? Well, the type actually depends on something called electronegativity, which is a measure of an element's attraction for bonding electrons. And it's a relative scale, there are no actual units. And the scale's based on fluorine, which is the most electronegative element, and you sometimes see it referred to as having a value of four, sometimes it has slightly different values, just depends on the table you are looking at. But whatever table it is, you'll find fluorine is the most electronegative element. You can see there, we've just picked out some of the more common elements. So we have fluorine there at 3.98 on this table. Uh, and the lowest electronegativity you can see there, the value is potassium on that particular table. You can see there are certain trends as you go from left to right, and there are also certain trends as you go from top to bottom. Left to right, you're increasing electronegativity, and top to bottom, you are decreasing electronegativity. That's the pattern then. Go from left to right on the periodic table, you'll increase electronegativity. 
Go from top to bottom and you'll decrease electronegativity. This is just a complete table of electronegativity. In this case, fluorine was given a value of 4, but you'll see the same general principles are still there. So, what general rules can we have here? So, if we've got different values of electronegativity and there's a big difference, then we expect an ionic character for the bond. And in other words, very different values for electronegativity or high differences, we have ionic bonds. And so we can regard the distribution of electrons here as atoms taking an electron and gaining a negative charge. And the other atom is regarded as having lost the electron and having a positive charge. So ions then of opposite charge are then held together by these electrostatic charges of attraction and it's the force of attraction that's regarded as the ionic bond. Okay, what are the general rules are there? Well, if there's little difference between electronegativity, then we say that the bond is more likely to be covalent. It will have a high degree of covalent character. In other words, the sharing of electrons is involved. If the difference is very low, you get a non-polar covalent bond, and if the difference is moderate, you get a polar covalent bond. Uh, can we be any more precise over this? Well, we can be slightly more precise. If the difference is greater than 1.7, then we would expect the bond to be ionic. If the difference is between 0.4 and 1.7, then the bond is likely to be co polar covalent, and if it's less than that, the bond is going to be non-polar covalent. Note that I'm only saying it's likely. There's no definitive boundary here for between each of these. So, what type of bond would we expect between potassium and chlorine ions to they form potassium chloride? We start by looking on one of these tables for electronegativities, and we'll find potassium has a value of 0.8, chlorine of 3. So I take the difference there, 2.2, that's greater than our 1.7, so it's likely to be an ionic bonding. Okay, what about water? Look up the values on the table. Hydrogen 2.1, oxygen 3.5. Not so big a difference here, only 1.4. And so here we say that the bond is likely to be polar covalent. Okay, what about oxygen? We have two of the atoms which are the same here. So the electronegativity here is 3.5. Now, of course, the difference between those two atoms will be zero because they'll both have electronegativity of 3.5. So if the difference is zero, then the bond will be nonpolar covalent. Okay, now don't fall into this trap. It's the difference between the atoms. And here's an example, CH4, methane. The electronegativity of carbon is 2.5, electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.1. So the difference is 0.4. And that's the only difference we're concerned with. Forget the fact that you've got four hydrogen atoms. Right? So the number of the types of atoms is not relevant. This is a polar covalent bond. Okay, ionic or molecular. Here we have potassium chloride and hydrogen chloride. And if we look at the electronegativities, 0.8 for potassium, 3 for chlorine, 2.1 for hydrogen. So with potassium chloride, the difference is 2.2, so we've probably got an ionic compound there. And the difference for hydrogen chloride is 0.9, so we likely have a covalent bonding there. Okay, what else do we know about ionic compounds? They're compounds that form ions. They form them by gaining or losing electrons. In the solid phase, these form crystals. And crystals aren't made up of individual molecules. They have a lattice relationship so that for each sodium ion there's an equidistant chloride ion and vice versa. But there aren't distinct partners or groups so we can look at a lattice or sodium chloride crystal, the lattice for sodium chloride crystal here and you can see how that's represented. It's not represented simply as one sodium ion or one chloride ion. It's represented as, like as a sort of continuous structure. And we can also represent it in this way, showing a lattice with the different charges, negative charge for the chloride ion and positive charge for the sodium ion. So a formula tells us the ratio of anions and cations, and that's all. In a crystal of calcium chloride, it doesn't mean to say that there are going to be two chloride ions attached to every calcium ion. It only tells us about a relationship 
uh, or as a ratio within the lattice. So ionic compounds are more commonly known as salts. Here's a representation of calcium chloride crystals. This is the salt calcium chloride. Does this mean that ionic uh, bonding shows any particular properties? In other words, if you have ionic compounds, what can we expect? Well, normally the bonds require quite large amounts of energy to break them. They're usually dull, hard, and they're brittle. That's at standard temperature and pressure. They don't conduct electricity as solids, but they are good conductors of electricity when they're in a molten state or in an aqueous solution. They generally have high melting and freezing points, and their actual structure depends on the sizes of the ions and the ratios of the ions. Okay, so we must be able to say something about molecular compounds. They are covalent bonds. They're discrete units. Note that they are discrete units. So when two hydrogen bonds, two hydrogen atoms, sorry, are bonded to an oxygen atom, you get a cluster of three atoms, and that's seen as a discrete unit. That's different to sodium chloride because there we're only concerned with the ratio of sodium ions to chloride ions. So there isn't a discrete sodium chloride unit there. And a discrete unit is referred to as a molecule. The strength of the bonds in molecular compounds varies. They do tend to be liquids or gases. They're usually poor conductors. That means they're going to be good insulators. And they usually have low melting and boiling points. And there is a weaker force of attraction between the molecules. So here's a typical representation then of a water molecule with your two hydrogen atoms and your oxygen atom. The oxygen atom showing uh, a negative part and the hydrogen atom showing a positive part. So why does a block of ice melt before a block of salt? Well it's simply because the molecules or the forces between the molecules in water are weaker and so they can break more easily whereas the forces between the ions of sodium chloride are stronger, so they don't break as easily. Covalent bonds then have these intermolecular forces between molecules very often, and so we have intermolecular attraction. It's a weak force, but intermolecular forces sometimes have to be considered. They are, they are the forces of attraction between molecules. So they're only concerned with molecules that have covalent bonding, obviously and variation then is responsible for some property differences. Uh, in particular, it has an influence on whether the, or the temperature at which they're going to be liquids or in the temperature that they'll turn from a liquid to a gas. Okay, so let's go back and just consider some general ideas. Ionic or molecular? Are we going to have an ionic compound or molecular compound? Remember, the table's the clue. So you look at the differences between electronegativities. And for ionic bonding, large differences are required between electronegativities. So elements on the left have low electronegativity, those on the right will have a higher electronegativity. So the further apart elements are, the more likely you are to have ionic compounds, and the reverse applies. The closer together elements are, the more likely you are to get molecular compounds. You can, of course, have a mixture of uh, ionic and uh, covalent forces. Let's consider, for example, polyatomic ions. Right, polyatomic just means more than one atom. It's quite simple. So if we take sodium hydroxide, the sodium part is a sodium ion. But the hydroxide part, the OH- minus, is a polyatomic ion which means that the bonds between the O and the H there have a covalent character, but the OH as a whole, as an ion, has a negative character. So sodium hydroxide then has ionic and covalent bonds. That ends our brief session, our revision session on bonding, brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. For more information about Park Bench Tutors, look us up on Facebook or visit parkbenchtutors.com. Thank you for watching and listening. We wish you every success in your studies.